here we are to do a Bible study together. To study, to read, I hope to enjoy, and above all, well, actually to be fed, to be nurtured, enriched by taking God's word and hearing it as, as Jesus spoke it and as Jesus speaks to us now. Thank you for listening in. Uh, this is a long series in John's Gospel, but even if you've not heard one before, listen in to this one, John chapter 10. Let's pray. And so we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for every way in which you give us your word. But most especially in the coming of Jesus Christ, in his life, in his death, in his resurrection. And as we read today, his teaching, his anticipation of what was to come, and his knowledge of what, what stops people, what hurts people, what drives people away even, from seeing that you, Lord, are the way and the truth and the life. Bless us as we come to your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 10 is really very well known. It's the passage where Jesus talks about being the good shepherd and there are some very special verses in it that people have always loved and rightly so. We're going to just read the first half, uh, which is what we did on Wednesday afternoon, and I'm really just giving a little bit of a summary of, of where the, the study in person took us. Um, I was struck uh, just this week, actually, we were speaking with some young boys uh, uh, in the Boys Brigade up at Calder Bank about uh, signs of spring. Uh, actually, that was just before it snowed, but uh, never mind. <laughs> Nevertheless, of course, there are beginning to be signs of spring, snowdrops coming out, and very quickly, uh, one boy talked about lambs, lambs in the fields. You know, everywhere in Scotland, we look, there are sheep, actually. In, in, uh, whenever we go out into the countryside, we so regularly see sheep. And so it was uh, in the part of the world where Jesus worked and lived. And so to take an illustration from the world of sheep was a very natural thing to do. But natural not just because people saw them with their own eyes and, and of course knew a little bit of what was going on uh, amongst the, uh, the world of, of sheep and shepherding, but also because biblically the notion of shepherding had been used in many, many uh, books in the Old Testament very often to describe the, well, the work of God, actually, as well as the work of, of a good ruler, of a good leader, uh, to shepherd, to shepherd well, to shepherd faithfully, to shepherd against the wild animals who might come to attack. A very powerful metaphor that was deeply rooted in biblical tradition long before Jesus, as it were, came on the scene. And so here we have Jesus picking it up, and Jesus picking it up really rather wonderfully. So I'm going to put up the text on the screen, and what I do suggest we do is we take it in just little sections, and the reason for doing that is that I think we shouldn't get too confused that everything's just absolutely on the same tack. It's as if what we have here is a series of little thoughts well, little but profound, highly meaningful thoughts, inspired by this thought about sheep shepherding, that world which people saw around them, that world which had been biblically so deeply uh, ingrained in the tradition. But Jesus using that metaphor, that picture, in, in actually more than one way. And so let's just take one thing at a time, for all that sometimes we do kind of elide all of these things together. So I'll, I'll just bring up kind of one slide at a time, and then we'll, we'll see where we get. Probably for me, the, the, the controlling picture, interestingly, in the section is not so much Jesus saying that he's the good shepherd, although absolutely that is hugely powerful and important, but also him saying, I am the door, which is not quite the same, but it's certainly linked, or in some translations he says, I am the gate. Let's uh, share a little bit about where the reading goes, but we, 
are first of all going to get a section where it's about the shepherd, not about the door or the gate. So it goes like this. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow. They will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Let's start there. Jesus is speaking, and in some translations it even says he's speaking to the Pharisees. Actually, in the original Greek, it just talks about Jesus speaking to them, although them later on are certainly people amongst the Jews. Some translations reckon it might have been the Pharisees simply because this does seem to continue quite strongly from chapter 9. Not all commentators believe that chapter 10 is absolutely following on from chapter 9, but I think there's quite a lot to be said for it. Uh, in chapter 9, uh, if you were listening into the last Bible study, the account is given of Jesus healing a man who had been blind from birth. And Pharisees, not least, having been asked to kind of, in a way, give their opinion about what was going on, being quite divided about what this signified. Some inclined to dismiss or even become quite aggressive towards Jesus, others wondering what this sign could mean. And Jesus indeed treats the whole episode as, as very much a sign, a sign of, of what it means to be blind and what it means to see, not just in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense. And so these Pharisees, who were really the, the guardians of the of the scriptures, they were really uh, people who had devoted their lives to both not just understanding everything that scripture asked of us as human beings, but indeed hedging it around with all kinds of extra cautions so that just in case we infringed this commandment or that commandment, this is if we were Jews, the Pharisees would say, well, actually avoid doing this as well. The, the law says that, but actually you're very wise to avoid doing this also. Or the law says that, and let us explain to you exactly what that works out as. So the Pharisees, you can think of them, I often think, uh, as, as people who maintain the, uh, the purity of, of the law, uh, who wanted to keep pure lives in the sight of God. They were very conscientious, <coughs> um, strong, desiring to be faithful people. But as can sometimes happen with that sort of person, anciently or indeed in our own time, there is a danger always, of course, of perhaps not seeing the wood for the trees or in getting so caught up in, in minutiae and even in self-justification, knowing exactly why we're doing what we're doing and, and, and why it's right, that we topple into self-righteousness and even a readiness to judge and condemn others. And, well, in Jesus' time, these Pharisees couldn't actually appreciate the, the gift that was Jesus standing right in front of them. The gift of God, who had sent his Son into the world. They were so taken up with the book, with the, their understanding of the book that they could not appreciate the living word. Maybe Jesus was speaking to Pharisees, we don't know. But whatever's happening here, Jesus is concerned that when he speaks about thieves and robbers, that there are dangers to the flock, to the people of God, because that's really what the sheep refer to here. There are dangers to the people of God. If people, if there are others in the world who are, as we're trying to snatch them away from being the people of God, who are leading them down 
false paths, who are not nurturing them, who are not giving them the, the blessings that really, in the providence of God, they are absolutely meant to be receiving. And so, as Jesus has his real concerns about thieves and robbers, and it's just a metaphor, he is maybe not least thinking of those who were making life somehow harder for quite vulnerable people. In fact, we'd heard in chapter 9, this man who had been healed, having been blind from birth, was, was put out of the synagogue. His parents were frightened of being put out of the synagogue, driven away. And how does that help anyone? What is that about? So Jesus starts talking about, well, he uses this metaphor, this, this picture of him being like a good shepherd. And in the picture, you know, in many of these villages, they would have maybe at night gathered all the sheep into one pen and maybe had even a, a gatekeeper to, to make sure that the, the gate was shut, that nobody unauthorised came in to take the sheep. But then in the morning, perhaps each shepherd in turn would come and each shepherd would call out and the sheep would know the shepherd's call. And that particular shepherd would keep, take the sheep who were particularly his and take them off towards pasture. That's a picture that Jesus is, is dealing with here. And he offers that picture of himself, of the sheep hearing his voice and him leading them out, going before them. Shepherds in that part of the world, they always went first. The sheep followed after. Now, I think quite rightly in our, in our discussion together, people did find themselves wondering, gosh, do, do I always hear the voice of Jesus? Do I always follow where Jesus leads me? And I think that is absolutely an important question. But it's perhaps not the main question that Jesus is really wanting to address here. Because rather he's, he really did have the sense, and I think it continues to be the fact now also, that there are people who are able to, to tune in to Jesus, to, to recognise that voice of truth, that, that voice of God. And Jesus wants to affirm over against those who are, who are doing him down who were saying that Jesus was not speaking of God and from God. Jesus was wanting to say, well, there are many who are hearing my voice and who I will lead and I will lead them towards good pasture. That's really the, the, the force of his teaching, yes? I am the shepherd whose sheep hear my voice. They won't follow a stranger but they would flee from him. It's not absolutely clear what, what he's meaning there, but he certainly is saying that there is, a, there is the possibility, absolutely, of people out there who would, be, who would be not leading people into truth, who would not be taking them into good pasture. And so that's where he starts. Actually, even in the way I'm explaining it, it somehow doesn't seem quite finished. So he goes on a little bit more. So let's hear what he says next. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now, as I said in my very opening introduction, things just slightly change here. In the first little picture, there's, there's, a, there's a doorkeeper and Jesus, as it were, is just one of the shepherds who comes along, asks the doorkeeper, you know, how, how are you? Do you have a good night? Uh, I'm just here to get my sheep. The doorkeeper moves aside. The shepherd goes in, collects his sheep. 
But now the picture has shifted slightly and Jesus, having maybe not got everything across that he wants to, is now asking people to think of him as literally the, the door or the gate. And he ticks that because, well, doors open or doors get barred. But actually he's really thinking about a door opening. A door opening in him, through him, to the fullness of life, to life in abundance. And why would you not go through that door? Why would you allow yourselves to be forever just looking at that door and never seeing what's beyond it? Never trusting yourself to take that step of faith? So Jesus really wants his hearers to, to realise that, you know, that it's safe, but it's not just safe, it's, it's wonderful, it's true, it is utterly, utterly nourishing to come in through him into the presence of God, to go through him, with him, in him, to live life in its fullness. Jesus has this heart for people, people who are in so many ways vulnerable, full of anxieties, full of uncertainties. You know, this week we're seeing a war in the Ukraine. How scary is that? But in this country as well, a lot of anxiety, a lot of, a lot of fear, a lot of feeling that life is not all that it should be. And Jesus is standing, standing in our midst, saying, I am the door. Have you come in to life through me? Or are you living life just on your own terms? Or are you even allowing others perhaps to dictate how you live their life, how, how you live your life? And is that going to be good news? Or is it actually as the notion of thieves and robbers strikes up, is that not just bad news? I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Let's keep going. He's going to come back now to the notion of him being the shepherd. So he's tried to help the first few words on him being a shepherd by talking, well, Let's think about that door picture. Let's now come back to the shepherd thought. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I hope you see how this is really just lifting the whole thing up onto yet another level. Because now Jesus picks up the shepherd picture, most especially to underline well, his own anticipation of giving up his life, of giving up his life for the life of the world, for the sake of those who believe. And to lay down your life for others. Well, somebody who's a hired hand is not going to do that. You know, if he sees a wolf coming, he's going to, to leg it away. He's going to look after his own personal safety. But the good shepherd the Good Shepherd will do everything to protect the sheep, to safeguard the sheep, to allow the sheep to have their lives, their lives in their, in their fullness. And that is precisely, of course, why Jesus did go all the way to the cross. And he did it because he, with the Father, knew that this was the way. And this was the truth. And this was the life. 
that evil will not have the last word, that death and destruction are to be overcome, that fear, fear is time bound and fear one day will be no more and we shall know peace, peace in Christ, with Christ, through Christ. I lay down my life for the sheep. You know, it started almost with Jesus just picking up a biblical metaphor and looking around him at the sheep on the, on, on the hillsides and, and offering to the followers just that thought that he was there for them. But now he was, as it were, seriously there for them. He was going to give his life for them. So this teaching has become just so rich, and this is why John chapter 10 is such a much-loved uh, chapter, and people hold on to it quite rightly. Let's see how this last first section ends. And, Jesus said, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. <laughs> Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Just a little reference there, of course, to, to chapter 9. Because it is all a continuing narrative. This is why we're reading the whole of John's Gospel, to see how everything just keeps on flowing, keeps on developing, keeps on opening up. So what does Jesus say in this last little bit? We've been dealing with this picture, this metaphor. Now, it's biblically based. It's absolutely from the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is this huge collection of remarkable books telling the story of how God chose his people Israel and what God did for Israel and what God promised to Israel and what God expected of Israel. And so when we hear the, the words about shepherds and sheep throughout the Old Testament, the shepherd is, as I said earlier, either God or the one whom God appoints, anoints. But the sheep, the sheep are Israel. They are that chosen people, that one people among all the nations. But just as in the Old Testament, there are not just hints, but definite words that Israel is, is as it were, only the start of God's saving purpose. And that what has been promised to Israel, what has been asked of Israel, what has been expected of Israel is to be ultimately something, the word for the world, through Israel even. When Jesus comes, Jesus comes, yes, first for the people of Israel because he's fulfilling the scriptures, fulfilling the Old Testament. But then he will go out more and his word will go out further. And so when he speaks in verse 16 about the sheep not of this fold, I'm sure it is referring to, well, what the Jews call the Gentiles, whom the Jews would have called them others. But for Jesus, he wants us to be absolutely clear. When he's speaking about being the good shepherd, even though that's such a strong biblical picture of the God who cares for Israel, now it is also, we must understand, the God who cares for all the world. So I must bring these others also, says Jesus. They'll listen to my voice. Exactly the same sort of thought as earlier on. There will be one flock, one shepherd, 
And in John's Gospel, Jesus, Jesus is so strong about oneness. One God, one flock, one shepherd, one faith, one baptism. I talked about people losing it earlier, being, as it were, thieves and robbers, sadly mistaking and not seeing the wood for the trees. Alas, the history of the church, of the supposedly one flock. Since Jesus' time, we have allowed ourselves sometimes to be, well, diverted in far too many directions. Now, Christian unity is a huge topic in itself, but there's no way that Christians are not meant to be one. No sense in which we are not meant to be, all of us, one church, one holy, catholic, apostolic church. <laughs> I think we need to hear Jesus here. We need to work at it. <laughs> realize what it is that he calls us to be. And then he continues because the underlining of that unity is him giving himself for the life of the world. And so he says a little bit more about that. He talks about him laying down his life. But note in verse 17, he lays down his life that I may take it up again. We preach Jesus crucified. Jesus died for us. But we can't just have a full stop there. Jesus died for us so that he would be raised on the third day, so that we might live. Death is not the end. Beyond death, beyond even our spiritual death, is life. We need, in a sense, to die so as to live. And Jesus did die so that we might live. He wants to make very clear that he knows what's going to go on, that he is, as it were, in control of what would be going on. For all that it would seem that things totally unraveled and that the enemy got the upper hand and Jesus was ambushed and Jesus was killed before anyone could stop it. It was not outside Jesus's will, nor outside the will of the Father. Now at this point, whether it's about Jesus saying that he would give up his life or that the Father wanted him to give up his life, the Jews those Jews who are listening, those, that little section of the people of Israel who are hearing these words, were struggling. Is, is this madness? What's this about? But some are finding themselves more than, more than intrigued, needing to hear more, needing to see more. And this is the one, Jesus who has opened the eyes of the blind. <laughs> Maybe their eyes also were being opened, as I hope ours are. Well, that's as far as we got on, on Wednesday. Uh, we actually had quite a lot of discussion about quite a number of things there. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for listening. Let's pray. You are the shepherd of our souls. You are the one who has given up your life for us, that we might live. You are the one who opens up life in its fullness. This is your invitation. This is your call. <laughs> Lord, may we rejoice as we see, as we see and follow. In Jesus' name. Amen.